With all the news from WTCN-TV's expanded news-gathering facility. WTCN-TV, Channel 11. This is Channel 11 News at 10. Based on what I know here, you're looking at going to prison. And I like to do people stories, I like to do animal stories. I just like to put the camera on my shoulder and shoot. I'm not out to uh, get a lot of pretty pictures. I'm out to tell a story. Excuse me, can you spare some change for something to eat? Thank you, city was. And you don't always know who you're going to touch, but you're sure that somebody is going to feel something from it. Let me hold the elevator and say goodbye to you right here. <laughs> In a lot of ways, it's like a, um, a miniature motion picture. All right, rolling. Rolling. And speeding. Mark. Action. We're kind of like members of the USS Enterprise. We get to go to places that nobody's seen before. It's a fascinating, fascinating, fun job. Let's ride. Good evening. I'm Paul Majors. Each night you see me anchor the news, but what you don't see is behind the camera. More than 30 men and women who every day bring home the incredible pictures that impact our community and our lives. Their passion, their commitment, their expertise as photographers, as journalists, and as artists is unsurpassed. In fact, Care TV is being honored as the outstanding television station in the country by the National Press Photographers Association. We're proud of our colleagues. Tonight, we'd like to share with you a look back at their phenomenal work in 1994. Picture this, the people behind our images of excellence. Because that's liable to go any minute. Clear the area. Images that made our hearts race. <laughs> and our hearts break. Are you ready for some hockey tonight? <laughs> images that brought cheers of joy and tears of sorrow. On fire. Images that mirrored our dreams as well as our failures. We called him Sergi Bear because um, teddy bears don't have hands. Images we will never forget. I think we all know to pick up a camera, how to focus, how to perhaps get a creative angle. I mean, we're all artists in some ways, but I think maybe what I bring to, to the stories is, is the ability of getting close with people. Mark Anderson, please call 215, Mark Anderson, 215, please. And few can photograph those images of celebration and struggle like Mark Anderson. Two years ago, Mark was singled out as the nation's top photojournalist. And this year, he was hailed again as runner-up, thanks in part to his compelling tale of a Russian orphan adopted by a Minnesota family. I'm going to America, to Minnesota. <laughs> oh, the windows. The windows are the most powerful pictures I've ever been a part of. When, when the family, when the Bai family from Shorewood split with Sergei in their arms, when they left, and I looked up into the orphanage and I saw all the kids waving goodbye, I mean, I literally put down my head and I started to cry. And to me, really, when I do share that emotion, when I get involved with the people, when I feel the love of those kids waving out the window, to me, that's the secret to an award-winning photojournalist. My name is Mark. Hi, Mark. If it was okay that if I got a picture of you guys going on in. Sure. But it's also Mark's ability to take the ordinary and make it memorable that sets him apart. Whether he's shooting a story on local theaters or a baseball field in the middle of nowhere, Mark's gift is his genuine curiosity. Appreciate putting up with me back there. No problem. And I always love rural Americana images. And I saw this cool baseball field. I thought, man, that's kind of cool. And I noticed in left field was a bean field and right field was a corn field. And then next to first base was a cemetery. I said, what is going on at this baseball stadium? And then I look up, and it says, home of the Meesville Mud Hens. I said, I'm there. What is a mud hen? All 
is quiet along this stretch of Dakota County countryside. Nothing new with that. Meesville, Minnesota is mostly farm country. But on 20 nights, as the summer sun slowly sinks, the people of Meesville make a little noise. That's right, go mud hens, the Meesville mud hens. Baseball with a serious sense of humor. <laughs> a mud hen is a duck that lives in the mud. Go, go, go Meesville mud hens, go, go. This is the life. Oh, I lost my beer over here somewhere. They've been playing amateur baseball here in Meesville since the 1930s. Just three years ago, the mud hens nested into this new permanent home next to the cemetery. Thanks to donations from townspeople like the Friermuths who live sure just past the bean field. I sure hope Freddy's on tonight because this is a pretty important game. Well, I sure hope that Meesville smokes him tonight. A mud hen actually is, uh, it's a, well, it's, it's, a, it's a little black bird <laughs> that, that nobody wants to shoot when you're duck hunting. <laughs> I'd be proud if my son was a mud hen. Damn proud. To have the notoriety of having a winning ball team, you know, means a lot to, you know, because, hey, how many people we got? 160 or something like that? There's six, 19, 20. Thank you. Hey, it's not cold here. Hey, who's ready here? Hey. My dad played for the mud hens in, uh, 61, early 60s. When you can afford to come here, you, you get a can of beer for a buck and a half. Ball? You're, just, you're kind of lazy. Just get get your hands up farther and just throw it. I've watched the game since I was a little guy. Kind of was a bad boy. I hung on the dugout when I was younger. I always wanted to play for him. Who's got it? Uh, I think people are hungry for outdoor baseball. And just with the lights this year, we've really found quite a difference in our fan base. A small town, it's like, come out here and play. It's a community where everybody wants to be known. You know, everybody knows, loves their baseball. He's still mud hens, Jay Johnson, 40 years old, batting third. <laughs> It's local guys, you know everybody, their first name, middle name, you know what they do, where they live, and say hi, and how's it going? You know, it's home, home stuff. Home stuff in a hometown that lives and dies by baseball. Eric Olson, CARE 11 News, Meeseville. Picture this, the people behind our images of excellence will return in a moment. I love sound. There's a sound that goes with every picture. And the nice thing about it is, most people don't notice. Because it sounds like it's supposed to sound. And I've gone to extremes to do that. Planting five microphones around a yard in, in bird feeders or in bird houses or under the grass so I can get the little sound of a bird, you know, picking a worm out of a dish or something. And maybe nobody notices, but I do. Let me hook a mic up to you. The term picture perfect may well describe Lane Mickelson's goal at CARE 11. He is, by all accounts, a perfectionist. And capturing that unforgettable moment, he says, has as much to do with what you hear as what you see. Just listen. Well, I want to grab a leg. The uh, regular ticking. Now match Lane's trained ear with his creative eye, and the result is stunning. It's hard to believe this visual artist is colorblind. Considered totally colorblind, because I see about 65% of the color that exists, but I don't see any color correctly. And I've never done a story on fall leaves because the leaves in the fall do absolutely nothing for me. 
But when a story does something for Lane, the sights and sounds are almost sure to combine for a truly perfect picture. So it is with clearing a path. It looks quiet and motionless. It is neither. Listen. The ticking sound is that immense ice sheet grinding against shore ice. Listen again. The ice is two feet thick or more. And it's time for the shipping season to begin. Taking one. That's where the sundew comes in. One's in. A Coast Guard buoy tender built 50 years ago to operate in the ice. Runner midships. The sundew has for just as long broken ice. That rounded bow there is one and a quarter inches thick. We're almost ready for the horn. <laughs> she weighs 1,020 tons. She broke out Duluth Harbor last week, did two days work in a half day. Now she was to cut a path to two harbors, 22 miles through thick ice. And she had visitors aboard. Close to 50 family and friends and media were aboard to get a first-hand look. That's great. Unbelievable. But Commander John DeYoung was out to get work done, too. And he had to remind his lookout. Watch for ice fishermen. Ice fishermen. Commander John DeYoung was serious. There were no boats on Lake Superior, but there were anglers more than a mile from shore. The Sundew had broken a track six and a half miles long. It had been hard going. Ramming speed. And things didn't promise to be any easier. We uh, grind slowly to a stop, and uh, once we're completely stopped, we back up about three ship lengths, uh, put the pedal to the metal, and get some momentum up, and, and then uh, ram it. The ramming forces the ship's bow up on top of the 30-inch thick ice, and the weight of the ship breaks it. We haven't seen ice like this probably since the winter of 78, 79, when, when the lake froze completely over. And that, and that was the first time in 85 years that it did that. And big taconite carriers were scheduled to leave Duluth. Their masters wanted them loaded, heading through the locks at Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, when the locks open Friday. And the Sundew had to open the first path, 22 miles long, through ice two feet thick. Big chunks of ice. It's awesome. Ken Speak, Care 11 News, on Lake Superior. That's the lucky thing for me to be the outdoor photographer is it's really hard to shoot ugly stories in Minnesota outdoors. I mean, you've already got a huge bonus. After many years as a news editor and photographer, Regina McCombs now works almost exclusively with reporter Ron Shera on CARE 11's Minnesota Bound segments. Whoa! She is a pioneer in a male-dominated industry, but says it's not her sex that sets her apart, but rather her attitudes about what makes a good story. You ready to duck, Regina? Ron is a wonderful hunter and fisherman, and he loves that. I mean, that is what he really loves to do. And the other guys that have done this thing have also been hunters and fishermen, and so they loved that, and that's great. And I mean, I think that's part of it. I mean, that's obviously a big part of what Minnesotans like to do outside, but I don't think it's the only thing. And I tend to be more interested in some of the other things, the biking and the, you know, rollerblading or canoeing or camping. Or kayaking. It was Regina's influence that gave us a sea level perspective of the spectacular North Shore. Minnesota's North Shore, famed for natural beauty, a place where ancient rock meets the great inland sea. Lake Superior, so awesome, so cold, so feared when the whitecaps fly and the surf thunders against the land. But not by all. Who would paddle into such an unfriendly setting? These are kayakers, paddlers of sea kayaks, a craft that's at home in the waters of Gitche in any mood. But now kayakers have their own paddling route, the Lake Superior Water Trail, being developed by the DNR in cooperation with North Shore residents. Right now we've just developed a, a pilot section of the trail, a pilot area, and it uh, goes from Gooseberry Falls State Park to Tedagoose State Park, about a 20-mile segment of the, of the shoreline. 
Kayakers say being intimate with such a huge sea gives mixed emotions. I just enjoy the water. I mean, you get to a point where the water gets rough enough where you get a little bit uh, intimidated and fearful, and that's probably good. But, uh, I really enjoy it because I feel like I'm part of the lake, and you feel the energy of the lake, and uh, you see the other paddles rising and falling with you, and it's, uh, it's a real exhilarating experience. I'm Ron Shera, Minnesota Bound. Part of my goal with Minnesota Bound is to take people there or experience something new or whatever. Those mountain bike trails, those guys were on, I can't do it. Gaffers tape a little camera on there and ask a guy to carry the pack on his back and take it along and then he can show you what it's like to ride those trails and crank up those hills. As you can see, it's very bumpy, that's why shocks come in handy. Those unique camera angles have become a CARE 11 trademark. Man, this is squad one. We've got fire in the attic. We need somebody to open up the roof. The first part of the story, we mounted cameras on uh, firefighters' helmets to uh, get the unique perspective of, of what it's like to be inside a fire. Squad one, give us water. Photographer Dave Dennison actually lived with the St. Paul firefighters for two weeks for his series, Get Out Alive. And with his five photographer crew, strategically placed nine cameras in a vacant house that was then set ablaze by the St. Paul Fire Department. This remarkable footage is so dramatic it won first place in the National Press Photographer's in-depth category. But more importantly, Get Out Alive is now being used as a teaching tool by fire officials all over the world. It, uh, I think, gave people a real new respect for what it's about. And I think if people have a house fire who have seen this story, they will get out of the house. Coming up, Dave Dennison goes to the dogs for a softer side of photojournalism. But there is no fun in games when the sun goes down. A frontline foot soldier. Uh, when the scanner goes off, there's something to chase. It's time to rock and roll, and I chase it. Right along on the overnight shift, when picture this, the people behind our images of excellence returns. This is, by the way, Dave Dennison. Hi, Dave. Nice to meet you. I'm Dave. <laughs> Oh, well, look, you guys are missing it here. Oh, <laughs> I, I like that, just in case we uh, stories with humor. Oh, can you do that again? <laughs> I mean, any time I get to, I laugh while I shoot. I mean, I have a good time. And Dave may appreciate the sound of laughter or any sound more than most of us. The star photojournalist suffers from as much as 65% hearing loss. But true to his optimistic spirit, it's that same disability that has brought him success. I've learned not to take sound for granted. Even though I don't hear very well, I think it forces me to be more disciplined in how I gather sound as far as my interviews with people or, or uh, just the sound of the shovel scraping along the dirt. I always want to give people a feeling for what it's like to be there, and you don't want... And sound is, is part of it. Sound is such a huge part of what we do. Good boy. Well, I think the favorite part of my job is meeting people like this. I mean, there's, there are people who I met in this job that I would have never met otherwise. Uh, people like... Uh, well, Jim Furman, there was a guy that I did a, a story on who's a greeter at Dayton's, brought his character home to people. I think that was really cool. The sun is the skyline's alarm clock. One more groggy morning in Minneapolis. Downtown, the streets can be loud. The coffee can be strong. But nothing wakes him up like Jim Furman. Live it up, Jim. Have a good day, everybody. Hey, good morning, gang. Take it easy. Technically, he's a loss prevention officer. Take care of yourself. But the 3,000 who use Dayton's daily as a morning shortcut through the Skyway know Jim is a one-man customer relations department. Always be positive. Hey, gang. Every morning, 6.30 sharp, he is a smiling, heel-spinning, hand-pumping jolt of caffeine. Here you are. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Don't clean it up. Oh, oh I know. It's going to be a good Friday. Now enjoy life, though. That's the main thing. If he doesn't know your name, you too, sunshine. He gives you hey, one. Hey, nice person. Oh, hey, helper. Oh, I got help. Hey, special person. Hey, happy lady. Good to see you. He always knows. He always keeps track and knows when you're going and wants to know where you were, what you did. If you're ill a day, he knows. Well, Carrie, son of a gun. It's the only good. only way I can get to work and really know that I'm really there. I mean, he, he tells me I'm alive in the morning. They're going to miss him here. Miss him because the man who says good morning is saying goodbye. I'm going to miss you so much. <laughs> Nice. I like seeing you here every morning. At 63, he is retiring. 
He's worked at Dayton's since he was 19. Hey, good morning, gang. Hey, oh, hey, cheers. Oh, it's the most beautiful day to retire. Oh, what a guy. Some might go quietly. This is my party. Jim hosted his own retirement party. Could you just put your name on here and sign something for me? His surprise life-size cutout card filled so fast, employees had to bring another. Isn't that nice? And another. Hey, good morning. Like my husband said, he, we hope that he has social neighbors. <laughs> just take care, OK? You're a nice Come person. Yep. Yeah. You're a nice person. This is the hardest part. If the hardest part for most of us is greeting the morning, for Jim, it's letting it go. If you had a chance, you want to sign this for me. I like. But the coffee only lasts so long, and good friends have to go to work. Yep. I'm gonna hang her up now. I gotta go out now. It's the start of another day. Uh. Bye. Take it easy. Dave Wildermuth, Care 11 News, Minneapolis. Good Morning Goodbye became Dave Dennison's second national champion. But it was Mark Simonic and reporter Melissa Young who came up with a younger variation on the feel-good theme in Lemonade Stand. I think when you think of places like Rwanda and other places like that, you, you, they're across the ocean, they're far, far away. They don't really touch you, but when you see 8, 9, 10, 11-year-old kids doing something, even if it's 300 bucks that they're going to raise, doing something for somebody they have no contact with, or no idea how bad conditions are, it really hits home. You think, well, what can I do? Donate to Africa! Help, 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 help. You can save it! You can save it! Donate to Africa! 25 cents can make a difference! A penny can make a difference! The calls echo through these suburban streets. Some didn't know what to make of it. Swarms of children taking their message to the streets. 25 cents. Okay. Others came looking for them. Yeah. The excitement and enthusiasm and the, the community spirit that this has developed here, I think is worth every penny that they earn. Mikey, we have $20. Casey Klein started it all. Her mother reminded Casey about the poverty and plight in Rwanda. She showed me the picture in the newspaper that's right there, and it made me a little sad. That concern led to action. <laughs> A lemonade stand. Neighbor Ross Greving was drafted to help. We started selling, and then Mikey saw us, and he came down, and then more people came down. Now it's a neighborhood project. Sam's Club donated drinks. Parents mix it up. That's my mom. I made flyers. OK, Sarah made this, and Ross and I made these two. Some found the effort truly inspirational. They're giving us a check. Yes. How much are you going to make it out for? Some gave donations. Others took advantage of the lemonade being offered. Thank you so much for, for donating. Great, great lemonade for a great cause. It's the cause that's excited these kids. I think it's a good idea to give it to the Rwanda people because because they don't have any food or money and they need uh, and they need fresh water. They're learning a lesson that that even a seven, eight, nine-year-old child can make a difference and. You know, we're we're my, one of many who can impact change, and there's hope. We're going to be back in a little bit. It's a good lesson to learn at any age. Up to Wanda! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Like Melissa it? Young, CARE 11 News, Mendota Heights. Thank you. Have a nice day. I'm a storyteller, and I love to get inside the souls and the hearts of people, and, uh, and given time to tell wonderful stories. I was in the sixth grade. I wanted to be a sister, but I never wanted anybody to know it. And if anybody say, are you going to be a sister? I say, be a sister? A very special place reflects that philosophy. It is a poignant, seldom seen glimpse inside the walls of the hallowed Bethany convent. Thank you ever so much. When were you born? Tell us the year. A couple of years ago. <laughs> Sister, look, you're 103 today. It wasn't a dramatic story. It wasn't, it wasn't a kinetic MTV kind of story that overpowers you with, 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 with fast edits and, and, and all kinds of, of movement. It was quite the opposite of that. But the key was, was gaining their trust that they could share their quiet and, 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 and some private moments with me. Somebody asked me if I was scared. I said, why should I be scared of something that I've been working towards as an achievement? 
when Sister Anne Pierre got her other leg off, I cried. We all are very sympathetic with each other because we're all sisters, you see. We suffer with them, that's the truth. Sister Anne Pierre is near death. As is the custom here, a sister sits with her in the final hours. Sister Marie Philip has known Anne Pierre nearly half a century. I'm kind of thinking the joy she'll have when she sees the face of God very soon. We love you, sister. Goodbye, sister. Are you happy? Are you happy, sister? Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And blessed is we take the deaths as they come with joy and peace and faith in eternal life. In our joy, we always sing to your glory with all the choirs of angels, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God Almighty. Why do I do it? If I were to leave this, I would, it would be tantamount to, to a divorce. It'd be tantamount to, to uh, someone pulling my life support system and saying, breathe on your own. You've got three days to live. I think a lot of us tend to go out looking for stories that we personally can become connected with in some way. I mean, a lot of times we'll go out and do something because it's something we've always wanted to do or something we've always wanted to participate in. And this is kind of a venue for us to do that. And Ron Stover's feature stories are as photographically diverse as his interests. He's as much at home on stage jamming with a local blues band as he is walking through the quiet country fields of rural Minnesota. In Farm Auction, Ron chronicles one family's agonizing decision to sell out after decades of working the land. And uh, we'll get you all as quick as we can. What do you got, gentlemen? Nice day! Five, 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 and six. Everybody goes, everybody goes. Okay, ten, ten, ten. Ten. And now ten. And ten. Snow and sub-zero temperatures have done little to keep them from coming. Hundreds of prospective buyers, only a few of them serious, most of them here for support. You've been here a long time? Oh, yeah. It almost has the feeling of a social gathering. And each person here has his own opinion as to why the family farm is disappearing. A lot of it's retiring, I think. People, nobody to take over. Hey, John, you're four hundred, boys. When the hippies come in, that's what cost it. You think so? Yep. That's all the younger kids, they want to be a hippie and go to town. Okay. Yep, yep. Yo! 430. Yep. 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 Young people don't want to work on a farm anymore. Got it, sir. 449. Thank you, sir. Chuck Wickstrom isn't one to show his emotions, but as he watches a lifetime of work auctioned away in the course of a morning, you can see it in his face, a sense of loss verbalized by his wife and daughters. It represents sort of a cycle. We came as young people and we gave it everything we had. Yes! So when we leave this place, we're going to be leaving a big part of ourselves. Um, it's something, it's like youth, you can't recapture it. It's, it's home. And, uh, I guess I think about bringing my kids, you know, they won't see the, the stuff that I saw. We'd like to thank you all for coming out. If you're thinking about having an auction or know somebody who is, folks, please let us know. We'll be happy Words that have become almost commonplace in the upper Midwest, as have the scenes. All right. Goodbye. It's difficult to know what's going through Chuck Wickstrom's mind on this day, but Marlis Wickstrom understands in a way only a wife of 37 years could, and she captures it in a poem. Out in a field, I see an aging farmer gazing over the stubble of corn plants harvested months ago. 45 summers of nurturing, cultivating, growing. An uninvited tear escapes to a weathered cheek as he bids farewell to the soil he loves. Brad Woodard, Care 11 News, Isanti. 
Up next. Just a minute here for now, make sure they got enough water. Chaos, tragedy, and destruction are part of a photographer's daily grind. Oh, I love it. I love it. Gets your adrenaline going. Yeah, yeah, I mean, <laughs> but who's putting the pieces back together? Your job is so that when people watch it, they don't feel like it's edited. It just happened. Picture this. The people behind our images of excellence will be back in a moment. Clear the area. Okay. Breaking news is when something happens pretty much spontaneously. Looking for natural gas. We don't know what's about to happen. It's not planned. And uh, our job is just to go out there and try to do the story and stay out of people's way for the most part, like cops and uh, the fire department. Bring a line up and down. Yeah, we need them in right now. Oh, I love it. I love it. Gets your adrenaline going. <laughs> Gerald Jackson joined the CARE 11 staff just over two years ago. He's considered a general assignment photographer and often is one of the first crews on the scene for breaking stories. Check, check, testing, one, two, check. When a country check. church in western Wisconsin began to burn down last January, Gerald and reporter Brad Woodard responded to the call. When we got there, it was still blazing. I mean, it was this old historic church that was just going up in flames, and I just tried to shoot as much video as I could. I think what was special about that piece was uh, I was able to get pretty close to the fire department and pretty close to their personnel. They didn't mind it. I'll make sure they got enough water. There's just an, an abundance of history with this church. The first Presbyterian church of St. Croix Falls looked more like a hellish inferno. What has been nurtured by a tiny congregation for more than 100 years was almost completely destroyed in a matter of hours. It was a situation where we felt that it wasn't safe to have crews inside, so we pulled it back and we just uh, made an exterior containment on it. The fire broke out in the church's kitchen and spread quickly to the roof. Are we ready on the tower? Yeah, okay, can okay. I pull the lines off that uh, stinger? Are you tied in up there? It was a difficult fire to fight physically and emotionally. My oldest son was married here. Both our sons were baptized, were, were uh, confirmed here. Fire Chief Jim Tiffany has been a member of the church for 17 years. Ken Tabin, even longer. A lot of history. History for me, which has only been 25 years, me and my family. A building may be gone, but the memories built up and cited over the years will survive the blaze. Brad Woodard, Carol Evan News, St. Croix Falls. Nightside Mr. Homicide. Dispatcher, they just requested your code two. If you ride the night shift, you're really in the hot seat of Twin Cities crime. No news is good news because when there's no news, nobody got shot, stabbed, nobody's house burned down, and bad things didn't happen. And that's a good night. Lee Wall is the lone photographer between midnight and sunup for Carol Evan. It's very isolated. You don't uh, you don't see your co-workers. You don't know what's going on in the station, and you don't know what's going on in the day world. Uh, it says shots fired call. Is that how this came down? Oh, it's very dangerous. Uh, you, you're always watching what's going on around you. Uh, when you arrive at a crime scene, if there's not officers out and about, you don't get out and about. There are crime scenes where people are very upset that you're there, and some of the people have weapons and then say that they're going to do you right there, and I believe them. If I'm not afraid at least once a week, I'm not doing my job right. A lot of the things that we do on this shift may be unpleasant, but the community should know about them. If we could take every person that lived in Minneapolis-St. Paul in the area and put them in a squad car, my car, for a couple of nights, their view of the world would change profoundly if they saw what really went on out here. He said they just chased her in a car a few minutes ago. If we have nothing that occurred overnight or early in the morning that, that we're going to cover, then uh, basically do a rain dance and hope that we get something off the scanner. Early each weekday morning, Jeremiah O'Connell picks up wherever the overnight photographer left off. Hey, it's my main responsibility is to, to dig up news. Um, I work with a partner, Bernie Grace, and uh, we're with each other normally every day. Right now he's, he's working on something else. 
I'll be 107 downtown City Hall. Uh, we're not assigned a story. We go out and we have to find our story. Mainly our, our beat is a crime beat. Start our morning out where we'll go down and check the computer to find out what happened uh, of any interest in the city of Minneapolis. Sunny. <gasps> Here I am. Signed, sealed, delivered. I'm yours. Now, what are you doing here? Huh? Jacques Gusto. Yeah, we. Oui. How are you? Fine, how are you? I'm dandy. City Hall is a more natural setting than you might think for this photographer. Jeremiah was a police officer for eight years before turning in his badge for a video camera and a new career. Sort of. March, but I'll look over the last uh, 24 hours. And, um,. If something jumps out at me, then go into the computer and uh, see what the narrative is on it. And then from there, um, decide if, if it's something that we'd want to work a story up on. I love to investigate. I mean, that's, I think that's still the cop that's still left in me. I like to get my hooks into a good story, a good, strong story. Over the past 17 years, this ex-cop has earned a reputation as a hard-nosed, run-and-gun photographer, one who unfortunately learned firsthand how violent covering hard news can be. In March of 1989, Jeremiah was sent to the closing of a St. Paul pornography theater when he, along with a camera person from WCCO-TV, followed a group of protesters inside the building. People were pretty upset with us being in there and uh, told us to get those cameras off, and so I, I complied at that point. Cameras off, me. Two guys grabbed me that were working at the theater, ran me down a hallway, slammed me into a wall, spun me around, punched me in the nose. I was bitten. One of them had a black jack, apparently, and was beating me with that. And I took a pretty good beating on it and ended up uh, going to the hospital for that day. Today, Jeremiah still struggles with the painful memories of his attack. His back injuries and a bad heart are constant reminders of his human frailty. And yet it's not fear, but joy, even youthful passion that brings tears to his eyes. Passion for a profession he's not ready to give up. It's fun. It is a blast. Um, I enjoy every morning when I wake up and I get into my car. <laughs> it's exciting. It really is. Um, you turn that key on, you don't know what's going to happen. You have no idea. And uh, it's, just, it's just great. I love it. Still ahead. Well, I think we're working at capturing moments, getting what is at the core of human life and experience. Moments our news cameras won't ever let us forget. <laughs> when picture this, the people behind our images of excellence comes right back. Yeah. Yeah. Chief editor for KARE News, um, kind of like an, um, a traffic cop between promotion, uh, engineering, news, and production. Kind of like a guy standing in the road trying to direct planes to go left when they want to go right. To try to keep all that chaos from getting on the air, to make the air go smooth. The, the, the real job of any editor is to not be felt. It's called Special Open 6 o'clock. Before video makes it to your television screen at home, it's the job of Ray and this every editor to take the tape from photographers, choose the best pictures, and put them back together in an order that makes sense and tells a story. I think a lot of them still think that we actually physically cut the tape, but it's all electronic. Take some of this Petri dish. When I first started here, um, they were using a machine called a ballop machine which was uh, more or less an uh, overhead projector that bounced its picture into a TV camera. And now, uh, there are no ballot machines anymore, but uh, we're bouncing signals off satellites instead. Joel Johnson supervises editing for CARE 11 News at 10. He's been a mainstay on our staff for 36 years and pauses to reflect for a moment when asked if the great evolution he's seen has um, been positive. Being an older guy, I have a hard time with change. <laughs> But basically, yes, I, I really think it's interesting to see how fast it changes, too. It's sort of like a snowball effect. Well, I think we're working at capturing moments, at not being so concerned with the technique anymore, but really trying to communicate through 
getting what is at the core of human life. Squad one, give us water. He and his canine partner were heroes. A lot of nostalgia. I wish it would never end. Stay low, stay low. Not enough women. The shooting right across from our school. Who called 911? Stay Make it. Make your own heaven. And I don't think I'm prejudiced. I really feel that the quality of the, the product that we put on here is that much better. And I'm, I am really proud of these guys. <laughs> Thanks, Lee. Well, I think our staff is is like a family. We've grown up together, and I think we're exploring what we hope will be the next sort of level of television news. What I am most proud of is that there's still a point when we do it right, when we really commit ourselves to positive principles, and that is to inform, to enlighten, to highlight things. When we really do that, then I think we serve people. And whenever you serve people and you do it in a positive way, you should be proud of that.